Welcome. It's fantastic to see a full house here now. Um, my name is Binaz. I'm the chair, so I'll be keeping an eye on all of you and also Julie. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Uh, I would like to introduce Julie Dirksen to you. Uh, she's an uh, independent consultant and also an instructional designer. And um, she, she blends in different disciplines like psychology, neuroscience, change management. And she explores the possibilities of how we, how we can create long-term sustainable learning experiences for people. And today, the topic that she's going to share with us is around designing for how people learn. So without further ado, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Am I? Microphone? Can you, everybody hear okay? Okay, great. Um, uh, so yeah, so design for how people learn. Um, this is an interesting topic for me because I, I think that we're at a really interesting point with learning design or instructional design. Um, when people ask me what I do, I usually say I'm an instructional designer. How many people have that as a job title in some way? Okay. Um, how many people in the room do some kind of learning design? Okay. Everybody. All right. Um, I, in, I went to graduate school for this quite a few years ago now. Um, and when I was in graduate school, I learned a lot about, oh gosh, analysis. And I learned a lot about evaluation. And I learned a lot about process steps to follow. But the field of learning design, and specifically the field of instruction design, has a tendency to be based on process steps. First you do this, you define objectives, and you use like, taxonomy, and you do these different things. And there, you know, when it actually came to the design part, it would just sort of say, and here you design the intervention, which is kind of the equivalent of saying, and Matt Cannon here, right? Um, and so there aren't actually as many tools as I would like to see in terms of specific tools and strategies around creating kind of good learning experiences especially based on, you know, I found this out about my learners and I found this out about the content, so here are some good tools and kinds of things that I need to think about when I'm trying to create the learning experience. I think we as a field have kind of felt our way into that, that sort of bridging that connection between knowing something about our audience and doing task analysis or doing audience analysis and then actually turning it into learning interventions has been kind of this organic -y, you find good things, you try to figure out what works, all of that kind of stuff. And it happens very much at a tacit level. So when we're thinking about it, it's very much this kind of like, I can't exactly explain, but I kind of feel like this is a good solution sort of thing. Which, that's okay and it will get you to a certain point, but one thing that we know about the science of expertise and mastery development is that you actually have to take those tacit skills and bring them back into the explicit place if you want to be able to actually improve them. So you could be a pretty good golfer, for example, um, you know, just having played a lot and kind of gotten the feel for what's a good swing and all of these sorts of things. But if you're Tiger Woods, that's not sufficient. You can't just naturally be a good golfer. What you do is you get the video camera out and you map the golf swing and you have experts looking at it and you figure out the aerodynamics of it and all of these kinds of things. So you take it from sort of a tacit, I have muscle memory around this, and you bring it back into the explicit domain and you try to look at what am I doing what choices am I making? How does this work? How can we tweak it? So if we want to take instructional design and kind of move it up, we need to start doing that. We need to start going, okay, I think that this feels good and it feels like it works and this seems like good design. Now let's actually try to understand something about what we're actually doing when we're doing that. What are some of these things that we're trying to make happen and how can I look at them explicitly so that I can actually start to do them better? Um, I also think we're at a very interesting point professionally with learning design because um, I was talking to a friend of mine who does architectural design and he works a lot with space designs for things like museums and libraries. And museums and libraries are this sort of critical point in their existence where historically they've been around for a very long time essentially as the containers of information. So if you needed information about the history of X or information about, you know, you needed a science textbook or whatever, you would actually physically go to the library and you would get this information. And all of that information in our pockets all the time. We've all got smart devices. So if that's the case, 
then what's the role of a library or what's the role of a museum at that point? And it becomes more about what's the experience. How can I give you the feel of what, you know, early 1800s was like as opposed to just telling you information about early 1800s? And I think we've got a similar problem in learning design where for a long time people were able to make perfectly adequate careers out of packaging information nicely and pushing it out in some kind of electronic format. But that information is starting to kind of exist in a more um, cohesive and organic format. And by that I mean things like Wikipedia. If I can just send somebody out to read the Wikipedia entry on this, why do I need an e-learning course on that same content I, when I can just link to the Wikipedia entry? So packaging content in a nice format and pushing it out, is it valuable anymore then what, are, what is our role as learning designers? What are we actually trying to do? Anybody got any thoughts on that one? I'm just curious. This is the part where I make you talk to me. I'll call on people, I will. Okay. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I've been doing learning design for a very long time. And, uh, and I've started to shift my thinking a lot and now I'm, I'm trying to create guidance systems rather than, mm -hmm. than, than a training. Right. Uh, because I f I'm working with adults, I'm not working with children. <laughs> uh, that makes a big difference for me mm -hmm. in the way I design, and therefore I can trust that adults will actually work very well with a guidance system mm -hmm. to guide them to where they need to be to learn the competencies they need to learn or whatever it is. Uh, it's, not it's not one answer, mm -hmm. and it's not one solution, but it's the way I'm going with a lot of stuff. A lot right. of basic stuff is right. guidance. Yeah. yeah, I think absolutely. I think, you know, I keep wondering if we shouldn't just rebrand ourselves all as performance support or guidance or things like that. Anybody else? Anybody else have feelings about where this should all go? Um, so I think one of the things that actually Brian Solis also talked about this morning was about thinking much more about the experience and the content, mm -hmm. if you like, and building on the other person's point about guidance and how you support someone. I think it is about thinking more about the behavior change we're trying to create rather than the um, knowledge or information that we're trying to get people to absorb. Right, right. Our answer for behavior change a lot has been to tell people about things, you know, to give them information about it. And we're clearly seeing that that is not sufficient for certain behaviors. Anybody have any really stubborn behaviors you wish you could influence or change? Um, and, you know, the, the big topic um, is really around, so sometimes learning is the appropriate mode. We really do want to create a learning experience. We want to create the sort of overall experiential kind of environment. Sometimes we want to create performance support. Sometimes we want to create kind of different, in, different um, interventions. And really, learning is messy. You know, um, the process of learning is messy. We want it to be tidy and all fit into nice little boxes. And really, it's very messy and it's very spread out and all of those sorts of things. Um, uh, when that came up as the cover of my book, a friend of mine asked me if it was a lollipop or a round steak, the, the sort of brain swirl. I don't know, I think it just means learning is messy, but. Uh, so what I wanna know is what kinds of things, like what's, what's, the, what's the learning, you know, what's a topic for learning design that's kind of challenging that you've got on your plate or what kinds of things are people working on? All right, you just shout stuff out, that would be fine. Legal content, which is so exciting, right? So exciting. Okay, what about, anybody else have any other topics that their audiences are less than enthusiastic about, perhaps? IT security. Yes, very nice, okay. I'm sorry, could you say that again? Firefighting. Oh, that's at least kind of dramatic, right? Yeah, so, okay. Teamwork, yes. Okay. Essential business skills. Right, and, and I, get, I always get a little warning whenever I hear the word essential because it's always, are we talking backstory or are we talking kind of core stuff there? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes. Right, and that's a really interesting one because the process of filling out the template is probably a fairly simple process, but the actually getting it to be good content that is worth something, that's much more complicated. So, okay, what else? 
Onboarding, yes, my favorite. It's, it's the topic that has no behavioral objectives at all. We just want you to know stuff, be aware. So, leadership, yes, absolutely. There's a lot of, there's a lot around leadership that's really interesting. Travel policies, yes, I bet your audience is so excited about that one, right? <laughs> Yay, travel policies. So, okay. Yeah, software training, absolutely. And we've all been through some of that, right? We all know how exciting that can be. So if we want to kind of think about some of the key elements, because we've all done this. I've, I've certainly done, I've done massive software training projects. And, you know, um, Jane Bozarth, who's speaking, I think, right after me about social learning, one of the questions she always asks is, would you want to take your own e-learning? <laughs> See, the knowing chuckle spreads across the room. Um, some of it, I would actually add, some of the e-learning I've created, I would totally take. Others, oh no, 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 no. So what, what are the elements or what are the things that we need to be thinking about from a design perspective? And what are some of the things that we can, that we can do with this? Um, so I want to start with attention. When I was talking to, to Don about this session, he said, well, do design for how people learn. And I'm like, you know, I wrote a whole book about that and you're telling me I've got 60 minutes. So he's like, well, pick some of the key things. I'm like, okay, that's fine. So if we right we want people to to pay attention because we all know this learner right the ooh shiny learner who's got you know six different devices and is in the class and you know has got you know lots of things the short distributed attention span they think they multitask but really they're just shifting focus a lot you know the this is recognizable right this is recognizable it's probably us too um, this is the world we live in. So the issue of attention becomes really important because people aren't going to kind of learn and focus and be able to kind of benefit from it if we're not getting attention. So what about you guys? What are some of your really good strategies for getting people to pay attention or to kind of capture people's attention? Asking questions? Yes, thank you. That is excellent. What else? Use humor, right? Funny, funny is helpful. Engage them. Right, although engage is another, is a fuzzy term because like that's, yeah. so something that they're actually doing, okay. Yes, anything else? Surprise them and, yeah, so set some guidelines up ahead of time so that hopefully they're not, you know, although actually I think Jane would tell you that if people need to be on Twitter while they're in your class, then use Twitter while they're in your class, you know, as opposed to, sort of the forbidding of all devices and things like that. Help them understand why, right, what's this for? What's the purpose of it? So I'm really interested in this question of attention because there's this idea of like the length of an average attention span and what numbers have you heard? Six minutes, okay, right. Six minutes, anybody else? 20 minutes, yeah, that one floats around a lot. Like there's a 20 minute, what's that? as long as it's interesting. There we go. So, so everybody's heard this number, right? Six minutes, seven minutes, 20 minutes. There's a movie theater near my house. This is an actual picture of it. Every Christmas, they show all three Lord of the Rings movies, extended editions, back to back. People love it. It sells out every year, which is like 11 hours or something. So there does not seem to be a practical limit to people's attention spans. I think you could get hungry before you, you know, like, <laughs> you might just get tired. Um, but there doesn't seem to be a practical limit to people's attention spans. So where does this like six, seven, 20 minute number come from? And, and I'd like to argue that what that is, is how long people can force themselves to pay attention to something that's fundamentally not interesting to them. And, and I usually talk about this in terms of the rider and the elephant. How many people have seen this metaphor? Couple people? Okay. This is from a guy by the name of Jonathan Haidt, who's a psychologist out of, uh, he used to be one of the Ohio universities, and I, I think he's actually moved now. Um, but he talks about how your brain is like a rider and an elephant. And the rider is essentially your conscious verbal thinking brain. So if you think of your brain, if you go down by your brain stem, you get a lot of like automatic functions, things like breathing and heart rate and blinking, you know, stuff that works even if you've had other kinds of injuries. And then you kind of move up into your central brain, it's kind of right in the middle, 
all the part that's deep in there, is kind of like your emotional brain. It's your fight or flight. It's the amygdala. It's the hypothalamus. It's the kind of that emotional reaction brain. And then right up in front, which is sort of the most recently evolved part, you get things like the prefrontal cortex. And the evolution of the prefrontal cortex is one of the parts of the brain that seems to really give us an advantage when it comes for planning for the future. So if we think about it, um, uh, we have, so in the way he talks about it is this is kind of your rider. This is the part of your brain that talks to you, so you tend to think it's in charge. Um, but then there's this, all this other part of your brain that's also involved in decision making, which is your emotional, visceral feeling brain. So it doesn't communicate in words, it communicates in feelings. I'm trying to like decide what does procrastination actually feel like. I think it's sort of something like, uh, stuck, you know, that kind of thing. So that's that's an example of the elephant versus the rider. I know I should do this. So you know, the rider says things like, I should order a salad, and I really should get this homework out of the way, and exercising now will give me more energy later, right? That planning for the future part of the brain, whereas the elephant is saying things like, ooh, French fries. And hey, look, celebrity chef death match is on. And I'm just gonna lie down on the couch for one minute, right? So we tend to think that this rider is in charge, because like I said, it's the part of our brain that's kind of talking to us. Um, you know, and sometimes we can do stuff, you know? Uh, ooh, cute shoes, the elephant likes the shoes, but the rider says, no, but I can't really afford them right now next month. And sometimes you, your rider is perfectly capable of overriding your elephant. But if the elephant really, really doesn't want to, who do we think wins? How many people have ever had the experience where you, your alarm goes off in the morning, you're in bed, the alarm goes off in the morning, and you're like, I should get up, I should get up, I should get up, no. you know, it's going to be super crowded, and it's going to take forever to get to work, and I won't have time to print my notes before the meeting, and I won't have time to review that stuff, and I'll have to go in cold, and I should get up, and I should get up, and I should get up and you hit the snooze button anyway. How many people had that experience? Yes, that's all elephant, right? That's all, I have a logical answer for what I should do, and I'm not going to do it, I am going to hit the snooze button and stay in bed a little bit longer, because it's warm and it's nice. It's cold outside, it's raining, and I don't want to get up. So, one of the things that we want to think about when we're designing learning is Am I appealing solely to the rider, which is cognitive, intellectual, factual, informational, or am I, am I sort of attracting the attention of the elephant? And I would argue that our six to seven to 20 minute time frame is when our rider is desperately dragging the elephant along. And it's good that it can, the rider can drag the elephant for a while, because if you couldn't, you could never read things. You know, you could never read rules of those sorts of things. But if you're asking your learners to keep dragging the elephant along for long periods of time, we have a bit of a problem. So the rider can hold up for a while. Um, this is one of my favorite experiments. This is a uh, experiment that they did out of Stanford. It's researcher Baba Shiv and um, Antonin Dorkin. And they had people doing memorization. So one group, group A, is memorizing little short numbers. So, you know, two-digit two digit numbers or something. And group B is memorizing much longer numbers, so like five, six, seven-digit numbers, something like that. So group B is clearly doing a harder cognitive task. And then after they had kind of done the first round of their memorization tasks, they came around and they said, hey, we've got a snack for you. We can either give you this lovely fruit salad or we can give you this chocolate cake. Anybody have any ideas what the results of that one were? Yeah, the group that was doing the harder cognitive task took the chocolate cake almost two to one over the group that was doing the easier cognitive task. So thinking hard makes us tired. It makes us, kind of has a deplet depletion effect on willpower, basically. So my ability to continue to force myself to focus, if I'm doing something that's cognitively difficult, erodes pretty quickly, basically. So high cognitive load environments are going to have an effect on the willpower of your audience. And if the willpower is the only thing that's keeping them engaged in your learning, then you know, that's where we're starting to see those time limits and those issues. 
Uh, and this has to do probably something to do with how your brain uses glucose. Your brain is about 2 to 3 percent of your body weight, but on average it uses almost 20 percent of the blood glucose and other uh, essentially few chemicals that are in your bloodstream. And so if you're thinking hard about something, you are actually burning more calories than if you're not thinking hard about something. Um, uh, the, uh, the researcher who's done a lot of work on this is a guy out of Florida named Roy Baumeister. He's got a book called Willpower, if you're interested in it. Decision making. Decision making's got a really high kind of cost to it in terms of resources. And so if I'm using up my resources and I don't have a chance to kind of recharge them, then at a certain point my, you know, my ability to focus and pay attention falls off kind of dramatically. Um, and the future is really far away. So uh, this is a graph that has to do with hyperbolic discounting. How many people are familiar with that term, hyperbolic discounting? Okay, I'm obsessed with hyperbolic discounting right now. Hyperbolic discounting is a behavioral economics term that means we discount rewards depending on how far away they are. So if I asked you, I'm actually going to translate this into pounds, I usually do it with dollars. If I asked you, I can either give you 10 pounds today or 11 pounds tomorrow, how many people would take the 10 pounds today? Okay, about half. How many people are going to hold out for the 11 pounds? All right, so your willingness to wait a day for an extra pound, good, see, you have your riders a little bit more in charge in that instance. Um, uh, if I said I'll give you 10 pounds today or 11 pounds in a year, how many people are going to hold out for the 11 pounds? Nobody. We all want our 10 pounds today at this point. If I said 10 pounds today or 1,000 pounds in a year, how many people are going to go for the 1,000 pounds? Pretty much everybody, right? So we have a curve, this is a hyperbolic curve, that's where the term comes from, that says the further away a reward comes, the more I'm willing, the bigger it has to be in order for me to wait for it. So if a reward isn't going to come for a good long time, then I want it to be really, really good, otherwise I'm not going to wait for it. So if we think of people's attention as a form of currency, right? I am allocating my attention. I am deciding I will spend it here or not spend it here. Then when we ask people to pay attention to something that they can't use right now, then it has to be pretty good. Because the reward for learning something is actually being able to use it. So if I am learning about legal procedures or internet safety or whatever, and I don't get to use that for six months, then what's the problem or what's the issue there? I'm going to discount that reward, right? If, you're going to, if you know you're going to use something tomorrow, is it hard to pay attention to it? I'm going to need this procedure tomorrow. Probably not. It's probably pretty easy. I am not going to need this procedure for 11 months. We do not care that much. It's really hard to care. So, what if we have a problem where the further out the use of the actual information is going to be, the more I'm discounting that as a reward, and the less willing I am to allocate attention to it, what's the implication for learning design? Or what are potentially some of the implications for learning design? What could that mean? I either need to make the reward sound really big, but I can only make um, internet security procedures sound so good, right? <laughs> Because I can talk it up a lot and nobody, they're still going to know it's not 1,000 pounds. Really only 11, right? Or I can make it feel like it's closer. What are some strategies for making something feel more immediate or feel like it's happening right now? Simulations, Simulations yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Make it accessible when they need it. So instead of trying to tell them about it now, tell them about it when there actually is a day before they're going to use it or 10 minutes before they're going to use it. So we can either push out the training and make sure that they only access it when they actually do have a need for it, or we can try to, f if that's simply not an option, we can use something like simulations or games or, or scenarios or whatever to bring it forward so it feels like it's happening right now. Storytelling is another strategy. You feel like you're in the story, so it feels like it's happening right now. So one of the questions that we want to look at when we're thinking about learning design is really this question of how can I, um, how can I deal with this issue? If I am telling you something that you may never use, you know, it might be a safety or compliance issue, it may never really come up, but you need to know it just in case. That might be an instance where you, you, know, you don't have the option of 
if it's a safety thing, you know, they may not have the option of just-in-time learning because when it happens, you need to respond right away. I was talking to a client who uh, does um, it's fast food thing, and they, have to, they talk about what happens when um, a store gets robbed. And they've got the procedures if the store is actually being robbed, and then the procedures for the, after the store has been robbed of like, reporting it to the police and filling out the reports and things like that. Oh, okay. Sir. Okay. All right. We'll just, no problem. Thank you. Um, so, I want you guys, um, so we're basically bland, we're creatures of urgency. If it's happening right now, it's not hard to pay attention to. If it's happening sometime in the future, it's much harder to pay attention to. And you can do the math on this, like there's almost, you know, the, the, the behavioral economists have mapped this out with money, but you can pretty easily do the math. How much are you going to care? How far away is it? If it's, if it's, we do this with a lot of stuff. This is almost all the behaviors that we have trouble with as people. As humans, we really struggle with anything where there's a disconnect. So exercise. When do you have the cost for exercise? When's the effort expended? Right now, when you're doing it, right? When do you get the benefit for it? Weeks, months, something, you know? Smoking. When do you get the reward for smoking? When does the cost come? You know? years later when you get lung cancer. And the cost is death, right? It's hard to have a bigger cost than that. But if it's far away, we still discount it. Like if you smoked a cigarette and you knew you were going to die tomorrow, you wouldn't smoke the cigarette, right? So we do this all the time. We do this with everything. Um, but this is one of the big issues that governs attention. And, you know, this is sort of uniquely human. You don't have monkeys going, I should consider retirement planning. We also have trouble with, this is the important but urgent versus the important but not urgent versus urgent but not important. Maybe we should clean up all those file names before we archive the project. Something that's good to do now, but you don't really see the benefit of it for a long time. Versus, hey, five people responded to my Facebook status, which is sort of the least satisfying reward you can have and still have it register. And yet, because it's happening right now, it still feels bigger than, than other things. So. We really want our users to be saying, yeah, I'll be glad I know this someday. That's what we tend to ask them to do a lot. We'd really have the, rather have them say, I, I'm glad I'm doing this right now. I'm glad I know this right now, because I can use this right now, or I can do something with this right now. Um, so if we think about this, you know, it, this is one of the things for the first time you teach, you always do this, and then you kick yourself afterwards. I know you don't think this is important right now, but you're really going to be glad you know this someday. I taught project management to art students, even though it's a little bit hard to make it relevant for them, uh, as opposed to something where we've got a good scenario. You know, your senior account manager left the office and is booked on a flight to South America. You have two hours to audit the accounts and figure out if there's been financial wrongdoing. What should you look for? You know, if we can take things and figure out ways to make them feel immediate, or as somebody else mentioned, kind of push it out to the time when you actually need it, then we're getting around this problem. So if we think about that, um, what I'd like to do is actually take, we'll do it really quick, we'll just do a couple of minutes, but at your table, pick one topic that you have a hard time keeping people interested in and think about how can we make it feel more immediate for people? What's a specific strategy that we can use? So I'm gonna give you, let's, let's do like three, four minutes on that and then we'll hear from a couple of people. So go ahead, introduce yourself to people at your table. Pick something that's really horrible and figure out how to make it feel immediate.
on this one. It's cracking, it's cracking a little bit, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. I can put it. It's the receiver. They're quite old receivers. We'll try that. Okay, two more minutes. Yes, if you can, we'll do just a couple. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. I'm going to have to cut them off too. It's just sad, but, you know, it is what it is. Okay, if people can kind of just wrap up the conversation. All right, I'm sorry, I want to let you keep talking, I really, really do. Um, uh, we'll, we'll have more opportunities before we're done. Uh, but who came up with a couple of interesting ones? Who's willing to share? We've got one over here. <laughs> you just volunteered somebody else, I love that. Yeah. Um, so we, we had a, an example, you said it was in accounting. Yeah, an accounting piece of content that was not for accountants, so it was totally unrelated to the role that the people who were taking the course um, would be would be carrying out. Um, and we said that we needed to make uh, create scenarios, basically. Um, mm -hmm. And the fact that they weren't just created from nowhere, but they were based on real life situations mm -hmm. and um, analysis of subject matter expert input. Um, so that was to try and to try and uh, bring it bring it nearer and closer to home. Um, but the other thing that we came up with, or we were just considering talking about, um, was if that reward is quite far off, then what about manufacturing a a shorter term reward mm -hmm. um, in terms of um, we were talking about badges, then right. or even just some kind of recognition or tick in the box, pat on the back, mm -hmm. bribery basically, right. which you have to be slightly careful with, but. But yeah. to, to give them that, and instead of chasing people to complete it because they haven't, then you sort of um, uh, motivate them by uh, recognizing the fact they have done it. Yeah, yeah, and if there can be some status attached to it, that can be a motivator, you know, things like that. You're right, when we use extrinsic rewards, we have to be a little bit careful because you can actually have a negative effect. But if you can have something interesting, like you get some recognition for having solved a difficult problem or you get some, you know, sort of status around it or things like that, that can be very very compelling. Okay, great, thanks. Who else? What was another topic? Okay, over here. They're recording it, so they like it if you use the microphone. Hi, um, my name's Stefan, and 
I teach hybrid diagnostics for Toyota. Okay. And um, I've been quite successful in, in, in training people and keeping them interested because I challenge them when they come mm -hmm. to my course. I basically create puzzles. Okay. Uh, I throw cars at them that do the most strange things. <laughs> and um, the stranger I get the car to behave, the more people are engaged to actually solve that puzzle. Yep. Mm -hmm. so yeah, you create that kind approach. of mystery or, you know. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And you know, with a vehicle, you can do a lot of things, so. Right, right, <laughs> yeah. Um, because that creates that tension, and then people want to resolve the tension by finding the answer. So that feels immediate. That's definitely one of those things that creates that sense yeah, of urgency. So challenging puzzles, basically. Yep, the challenging puzzle, absolutely. Okay, how about one more? Anybody else? No, we had a nice chat, but we didn't come up with anything really conclusive. Fair enough, okay, that's fine. Um, so this is, this is one of the strategies, and I would be willing to bet that, that this isn't necessarily unfamiliar to you. It's not like you've never heard of using scenarios before, but if you can actually, this is what I was talking about, where if we take this, we understand a little bit better about why we're doing it and what we're trying to accomplish with it and some of those kinds of things, that you can start to kind of refine the practice around it um, and hopefully be better at it. So um, another category that we wanted to talk about in addition to attention is really the issue of designing for skills. And when I'm talking to a client, I use these categories, actually. I know that sometimes there's the knowledge skills, uh, attitude, um, KSA, taxonomy. I know that there's Bloom's taxonomy, which honestly I've never felt was super useful to me as an instructional designer. So what I did is I wanted to have categories of types of material or content that I can actually sort of say, if I have this, then these are interventions that I can use for it. And we're not going to talk about all of these, but I'll just kind of like acknowledge this is something I want people to actually carry around in their head. You know, I want the you know, memorization, or they need to know it cold, or you know, things like that. Um, information access, a lot of times that's what we're really asking people to do. I don't need you to know this information, I need you to know where to find it, and what to do with it when you do find it. And I find that separating those two is really helpful, because if I have an information access problem, instead of a knowledge problem, I'm not just going to tell everybody, I'm going to actually have them practice going out, accessing it, and using it, so they're getting accustomed to that behavior. Um, procedure, I define this as something where there isn't a lot of judgment involved. There's a set of steps, I need, you need to be pretty fluent with it, but it's not like there's a huge amount of judgment, you know, it's, there might be little dips or variations in the process, but generally speaking, it's going to go from A to Z and not too many detours along the way. Um, skills, this is kind of a big bucket for me. This is anything where I reasonably expect people to have to practice to develop proficiency and where there's more than one right answer. So if I'm doing um, training materials for people who are therapists, and I have done this, I've done training materials for therapists who are te treating people with substance abuse, borderline personality disorder, which is a really fun audience, I gotta tell ya. Um, but, uh, you know, no therapist is gonna respond to a patient exactly the same way, and that's fine. But how are we teaching people if there's no quote unquote single right answer for this? You know, so if I'm asking a project manager to create a budget, it's not like there's only a single right answer for what that budget's gonna look like. It's gonna be based on their experience, it's gonna be based on these different things. Or if I am asking somebody to design a web page, there's no single right answer in that category. And I find that if I am dealing with a type, a topic where there's no single right answer, then I have a different kind of instructional approach to creating learning around that. Um, and then habits. I've been separating out habits lately, because frequently things around leadership or things around those kinds of things or safety or whatever, I want a habit. I want an actual automated, oh, if this happens, I need to do this. If I want to be giver, better at giving my employees feedback, that is a habit almost as much as it is knowledge or whatever. We tend to treat it as a knowledge problem. I'm going to tell you how to give feedback to your employees, but you know, how many people have ever had that experience where either you or some of your participants come to a nice class, everybody learns it, everybody loves it, and they get back to the job and it just does not, like, just doesn't show up, <laughs> right? I'm getting nods. Um, and so habit formation is an interesting area and there's some interesting research going on in that space right now, a lot of it around um, health and wellness kinds of habits and things like that, but we'll soon be able to start kind of pulling that in and generalizing that into uh, learning and development, other learning and development. And then attitude is anything where they know the right thing to do and they're still not doing it then there's kind of probably an attitude. Um, uh, I want to zoom in on skill, though. Let's take a look at this. If you're teaching somebody skills, what do you think are some of the things that are likely to be important? 
practice. Yes. Safe failure, absolutely. Understanding why, why am I doing these things? Yep. Anything else? Yeah, so when we look about skill development, um, and as I mentioned, it's this one question, is it reasonable to th think that somebody can be proficient in that practice that we know we have a skill area? And there's this interesting thing, I call it the sports and things that can kill you conundrum. And I'll explain that. We know in sports, we know in music, we know in things that can kill you, so doctors and um, airplane pilots and driving, that you can't get to any real reasonable proficiency without really serious practice and good coaching and good feedback kinds of situations. Like, nobody's going to pretend that I can just explain to you how to play tennis and that you, if you've never picked up a racket before, you're going to be able to go play tennis. So we have visible proof, either through the failure to play tennis or through killing people, um, that it's a bad idea to do these activities without having really good practice environments set up. Uh, and yet we get over to topics like leadership, right? And a lot of people seem to forget that. I can just explain to you what leadership is and what's important, and somehow that's going to be sufficient in order to change the, change the behavior. So if we're thinking about skill development, if we're thinking about play skill, not a skill here for a second. So um, saving a file in Microsoft Word, skill or not a skill? Not a skill, okay. Um, you're all going to have to talk louder. I'm just going to mention. Uh, playing skee-ball. Do you have skee-ball? It's an American thing? It's a, it's a, you toss the thing and it goes in whole, you know. Uh, sounds skill-like, yes, it's skill-like. Um, giving performance reviews. Skill, right? There's procedural elements to it, but there's, there's skill behind it as well. Um, filling out a timesheet. That's skill. Calming and irate customer. Um, uh, building a database. Skill. Uh, designing a brochure. Mm -hmm. uh, making macaroni and cheese from the box. Do you have that too? Is that another American thing? Craft mac and cheese. I don't know. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it could be. It's probably pretty procedural. I think some people could argue skill, but I think that'd be dodgy. Um, problem solving a missing supply order. Skill. Yeah, that's probably a skill. Um, programming the shopping cart widget for a website. Okay. So we know that these are things we're going to need practice, and we know that there are likely things that here that there's not a single right answer to it. Um, so one of the things we want to think about is kind of what does the flow look like for these? Um, so if we think about when I'm learning a new topic, you know, your brain kind of gets busy, it starts sort of burning a lot of glucose, we talked about this before, when you're learning something new. But when you're using a familiar pattern that you've used a lot before, that's actually quite a bit easier. So if you think about learning to drive, when you're first learning to drive, it's all effort, right? You have to concentrate on everything. It's a really kind of cognitively intensive thing. Anybody ever had the experience where you drive home from work and you pull into your driveway and you totally don't remember the drive at all? Right? So after you've been doing, yeah. After you've been doing it for a while, you really automate a lot of these skills, which means that we actually store those memories differently. We're actually storing those kinds of things as sort of automatic gestures instead of very conscious gestures. And so part of skill development is learning how do we get people to that automatic gesture phase. And you need to start automating some of these gestures in order to really kind of move up the skill, skill progression. Um, and so most e-learning has a tendency to be structured like this. We've got an intro, we've got new information, we've got more new information, we've got even more new information, and yet again with the new information, and finally we have a summary, right? So it's this kind of cognitive equivalent of biking uphill the whole time. Um, if we think about the way that video games are structured, for example, you get new stuff, so it's uphill, but it's pretty easy. Then you might get, you know, some of the, using some of the behaviors you've already used, but we're going to throw in a new thing, or we're going to ramp up the speed. And so you get kind of more of this sort of cascade of, I'm going to let you cruise for a little bit and get comfortable, and then I'm going to add something new in. And then I'm going to cruise for a little bit and get comfortable, and then I'm going to add something new in. Um, stuff, you know, kicked up a notch. Finally, you get the boss fight, which is the big, hard battle at the end of a video game where you have to use all the skills you've learned to beat the boss. Um, so if we think about it, a lot of technology-based learning is this here, more, and then more, 
and then more and then more and then more, right? And if you don't give people, well, you know, and when that happens, every, and when everything's important, kind of nothing's important. But when you actually use more of this kind of looking at leveling and things like that, when we're thinking about skill development, especially technology-based skill development, the new things kind of stand out. If you're using a lot of practice that you've been using and then all of a sudden we kind of add a new element into it, then boom, that really kind of, that kind of stands out. Um, in addition to it, people are taking breaks anyway, you just don't necessarily know where. So if you ask people to bike uphill kind of cognitively the whole time, it's like, okay, I get it, uh-huh, uh-huh. Now I'm kind of distracted. I'm gonna look at the other thing. Now I'm completely tuned out. Oh wait, this is important, I should pay attention to it. And finally, brain dead, leaking out the ears, you know. Um, so people are taking breaks if, with your content where they're sort of letting themselves coast a little bit. You just don't know necessarily where they're doing it. So if we want to think about kind of designing for skills and creating these sort of practice intervals, what are some of the implications for that if we're thinking about um, what, which ones of the topics we were talking about before? I think we had, uh, oh, we had something filling out, it wasn't performance reviews. Traveling expenses, right? That's probably pretty procedural. Is there skill development at, at that one? What was yours? The accounting stuff? Um, what, what are some other skill-based ones that people had? Oh, it's warm in here and it's after lunch, isn't it? What's that? Being good at teamwork, okay. So what are, what's kind of the skill progression for being good at teamwork? What are some of the basic things about being good at teamwork? Communication, right, okay. So if I tell you how to be good at communication, you good at communication? Right. <laughs> so we have a problem. So what kind of structure is going to allow for more of that kind of gradual development, get comfortable, then ramp up gradual development? Um, James Paul G, who writes a lot about using video games for learning, calls this cycle, talks about cycles of expertise, where you want to get comfortable with the skill, then you want to break it and elevate it up to the next level. What are some ways that we could do that with communication? How could you, how could you kind of practice communication and then kind of create a harder scenario and then a harder scenario? Simple and complex topics, sure. Group size, right. Very small group communication and then dealing with bigger group communication. Okay, I'm sorry, can you say that again? Oh yeah, so you know, it's an easy message. I just need to communicate some procedural stuff versus now I need to communicate you know, massive changes in the organization, you know, those kinds of things. Okay. So we could go from how would you communicate these smaller things into how do you communicate these bigger things to how do you communicate hard messages to how do you communicate organization-wide to how do you communicate you know, massive changes, things like that. So we could actually create kind of a leveling structure where as soon as you get kind of good at this, we're going to bump you up and let you get good at this. And then we're going to bump you up and let you get good at this. If you do it right, you don't, bu you don't move to the next part until you're kind of showing some mastery at this level. Um, and pretty much games are structured like this. There's immediate little short-term goals, and then once you kind of get better at it, do you guys have Monopoly? Okay. So what's the immediate goal in Monopoly? What's the immediate thing you're trying to accomplish? Yeah, you want to get money, and you want to get a property, right? So you get one of the green properties, then what's your next goal? You want to get all the green properties, right? You want that Monopoly. Once you've got a Monopoly, what's your next goal? houses, and then you want to get all the houses, right? And then you go to hotels, then you want to get all the hotels, and then you want world domination, right? And you want to crush the opponents. So if we think about it, and you'll find this structure actually exists throughout all, most kinds of games, where there's immediate things I need to accomplish, and once I get good at that, then I can kind of move to the harder level and get good at that, and then I can move to the harder level and get good at that. Let's see. We are... I'm going to move on to the next bit. So that's another big thing that I'm thinking about. In addition to kind of this overall attention, once we've got their attention, if I'm genuinely working in this skill arena, how can I actually kind of create these sort of levels of expertise so that I'm moving people up through it 
as opposed to, I'm just going to give you three scenarios and then send you on your way, that kind of thing. What's that? Yeah. Right, and the, if you're doing that more of that kind of spacing thing, you're almost certainly kind of getting multiple touch points over time because of the, the likelihood that you're doing this all in a single kind of chunk is, is one of the best research things in all of kind of learning psychology is that if you get multiple touch points with content that you're going to increase likelihood and retention. Yeah, and um, sometimes that works. Uh, you know, the bad thing that will happen, you do want to create some kind of, the, the bad thing that can happen often can kind of create that sense of urgency or risk. I also think there's some really interesting implications for um, consequence-based feedback. So instead of saying, that wasn't a good choice, instead saying, the building blew up, you know, or you lost the sale, or the customer walked away. Um, I don't think I have slides about this in here, but people know things cognitively that they don't believe viscerally. We probably, I have, I know I have some of those behaviors. Cognitively, I know it's good to, you know, Actually, the, the evidence on vitamins is, is kind of coming out against it, but the theory I know I'm, it's good to floss every day, and in actuality, I may be missed sometimes, you know, that kind of thing. Like, knowing versus believing is different. And that how visceral your experience of it is it seems to have some impact on behavior. There's some research out of the Stanford Virtual Reality Lab where they were talking to people about um, paper. So how much paper you use, you know, paper towels, paper napkins, office paper, how that equals sort of deforestation. So if I use a lot of paper, more trees get cut down, essentially. And they put both groups through kind of the cognitive explanation of that, and then they put one group in a condition where they were sort of reading about trees being cut down, and they put the other group in a condition where they were um, in a virtual reality environment cutting down trees with a virtual chainsaw. And both groups came out and said, oh, this is clearly an important issue, I should change my behavior. But then the researchers, I love these studies, the researchers would spill a glass of water as people were leaving the room and then count how many paper napkins they used <laughs> to mop it up. And the people who had been in the visceral condition, where they were in the virtual reality condition, where they were physically experiencing the outcomes of their actions, used about 20% less paper napkins than the people who had been in the purely cognitive condition. And both groups had reported the same amount of intent but the actual action was different. So having consequences, having visceral outcomes, those kinds of things seems to make a difference in terms of actually translating into behavior change rather than just knowledge of what behavior needs to change. A couple of other little variables around time is um, faster slow skills. So when I'm thinking about skills, one of the questions, I love it when a client says, you know, the real problem is they're not good problem solvers. Could we, in the half-hour e-learning course, teach them about being better problem solvers? I love that question. The answer is no. Are you kidding? We're talking about a skill that's been developed over their entire adult life, and we're going to fix it in a half an hour of an e-learning course. Um, so what you can do around this, how, how fast or slow is that skill? And I'll tell you that this has been one of the most useful ideas. I'll actually skip this. Um, so faster things are procedures, knowledge, specific tools, techniques, slower things or skills or attitudes. Those take longer to change. And then foundational things like culture, core values, personality, you're probably not going to change those. So if those are important, then hire for it. Don't, don't try to fix it later. Um, and this is an interesting one because if I define, if I ask my subject matter experts and things like that to define is this fast, medium, or slow, it really changes the conversation about what kind of learning we're going to design. Because if they tell me it's slow, then I have a lot of latitude to come back and say, okay, so we're not going to address the whole thing in this one course. We're going to be, need to do it over time. Let's talk about what that looks like. So asking people when I create learning objectives to define slow, medium, fast has been really, really useful. So if we look at this, how to fill out your timesheet, fast or slow? Fast, yep. Um, managing a software development project. So, right? I had a client who was doing um, all of their, it was a massive uh, electrical installation projects, and they do all the project management training in two days. <laughs> it's 
So that was, that was a problem. Coaching employees, fast or slow? Slow, okay. Um, using Photoshop to crop a picture. Mm -hmm. Using Photoshop to repair an old photo. Medium, maybe. Yeah, probably slower. Um, querying a database. Yeah, it's probably medium-ish, you know, something like that. Um, designing a database. Slow, right. Uh, the biggest benefit of this, of just being able to kind of attach these designations to stuff, means it changes the conversation when you're doing curriculum planning. If you say it's fast, medium, or slow, that really can help because you can say, okay, we can knock fast stuff out really quickly, but we know that we're going to have to have come back a couple of times. You know, maybe we'll have a webinar mid-range and we'll show examples of budgets and have them just talk about what was wrong with this budget or what worked well on this budget or things like that, and then we're going to have some coaching follow-on afterwards. We know this stuff. We have kind of an intrinsic feel for it, but as I mentioned at the beginning, if we can take these things where we sort of intrinsically know that these are slow skills and actually label them as such, it really can change the conversation with stakeholders, with subject matter experts, things like that in terms of uh, actually designing. Right. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And there are some different strategies around that. If you've got a really diverse audience, then trying to. Uh, Kathy Moore, how many people are familiar with Kathy Moore? A couple of people. Uh, if you Google her, you'll find her, but she's a fantastic instructional designer and has a really good blog. Um, she talks about, uh, you know, some people like iced tea, some people like hot tea, and what we tend to do is make lukewarm tea for everybody which nobody likes. Um, so the question is, if you've got a really diverse target audience, should you have the same intervention for that entire audience? And if the answer is yes, we have to have the same intervention, can you kind of create layers in that intervention so that if it's an audience or they can kind of dig deeper, but if it's an audience that can actually move pretty quickly, they can kind of get through it without a lot of obstacles in the way. So um, I think it's about designing, designing learning environments rather than kind of like straight follow the line from beginning to end courses. Okay, oh, oh playing chess, that's probably pretty slow too. Um, uh, and we are right down to the end of it. I had more to talk about, but we'll stop here. Um, are there any questions though? No. <laughs> I have stunned you into immobility. It's the post-lunch lull, right? So clearly a, a leveling approach to training out skill is going to embed the skill mm -hmm. over the longer term. Yep. But I can see a real conflict between taking that approach and the time the business wants to invest in people learning. Right. Because you say to people, look, this is, this is the approach we're going to take and this is why, but actually it's going to take four times as long yep. as you normally take. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that uh, challenge yourself? Um, if they're the ones telling me it's a slow skill, then I have a lot more, I have a lot more leverage around that, which is part of the reason why this has been a useful kind of conversation. Because if they come back and they say it's a slow skill, and I say, okay, well, here's how we can treat fast skills, here's how we can kind of deal with medium, here are strategies for slow skills, and they're the ones coming in and saying it's a slow skill, it, because if you're just saying, hey, it takes a long time to do that, it feels like you're saying, I, I hear what you want, which is you want people up to speed quickly, and I'm saying, no, I'm just not going to do that for you. Whereas if they're the ones telling you, yeah, that is a slow skill, it does take a long time to develop, then, then I get a lot less pushback on that conversation. And realistically, you find a lot of people say, yeah, take as long as you need, you know, it, is a, yeah, it is a slow part skill. Of it, part of it is lately I've been having clients who actually care if their learning works, which is really great. So I may, I may be living in a slightly rosier world than, than some people. Um, so, you know, but I, I honestly, I'll ask that question too. Do you care if this works or is this, you know, is this a compliance issue? You know, because that's the business need. Sometimes the business need is compliance. If you care if it works, let's talk about what's actually going to make it work. So. Yep. I can't say to the... Um to the business world, but actually we would expect them to be competent to the li this level at this time, and then yep. we would expect to be seeing, you know, expert behaviour slightly later. So yeah. you, you know, you can, um, 
you can sell key, key milestones to the stakeholders if mm -hmm. it's a slower scale, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and that's the thing. If you've got levels to find, so here's what level one proficiency looks like, here's what level two proficiency looks like, you say, okay, great, you've got this amount of time, we can totally do level one in that time frame. Um, we're not going to get to here, but we can get to here. Yeah, absolutely. So, very good point. Thank you. Anybody else? Any other comments or suggestions on that? Con questions? I think I think they'll probably have coffee, won't they? Y'all need to. <laughs> well, right. thank you very much. Thank you.